Good morning. This is John from the Springs Mennonite Church. And I'm here on the second day to talk about the fruit of the Spirit. Now, yesterday I went through all of them and then jumped down to the reasons for them. Today I want to start my journey backwards, back to what they are, and talk about them some. So let's read them again, and I'll, I'll read all of them just to keep them in mind. But the Holy Spirit, this is Galatians chapter 5, by the way, verse 22. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. This is what the Holy Spirit produces in the lives of those who call themselves Christians. So let's look at them. Take the first two, love and joy. Well, most of us kind of have an idea of what love is. And as you probably know, or have heard, if you've been in church many years, there are three different words that are used in the Greek that we translate into English love. This one is the type of love called agape love, which is self-sacrificing love. It is putting aside something that you might want for the benefit of someone who might want something else. Now, let me give you an example. And you've probably heard something like this in other situations, but whenever we go out to eat, I would always, always ask my wife, where do you want to go? Now, she can't drive anymore, so she can't go anywhere I don't go. <laughs> I, I realize I'm in the controlling seat of the car. But I'll say, where do you want to go? And many times she'll say, I can't drive, don't ask me, go where you want to go. No, where do you want to go? And, and it could be, it really could be that I just don't want to decide. But I know at least 99% of the time, that's not my motivation. My motivation is I really want to know where she wants to go. And I will tell you that most of the time, if I don't want to go there, I'd probably say, okay, anyway. Because I don't know that it really matters all that much. And even if it does matter all that much, why does it matter that I get my way? Now, I, I don't mean to be a doormat and get walked on and those of you who know my wife, that's not very likely to ever happen. But this notion here that the Spirit gives us love, self-sacrificing love. It's hard to do sometimes. And when you first start doing that, it, it gets difficult. Now I know I've married some young couples uh, recently, and and for them, everything is, oh, hunky-dory, let's just do all this stuff together. Life is going to be a breeze. And I know it's, it is, but it isn't. Because living a life where you give to others has to be a deep, heartfelt choice even if the consequences may not be as you'd like. So Paul's saying here that one of the fruits of the Spirit, one of the things that marks those who have decided to let God walk with them th through this journey of life, one of those marks is love. Now, the second one here, he says, is joy. 
Joy is kind of a crazy thing. A lot of people claim that they're happy. And I can't argue with them. I don't know what's in their head. Maybe they are happy. But I can say that it sure doesn't look like it. It's kind of hard to be joyful and walk around with a frown on your face all the time. It's kind of hard to sing the song, Joy to the World, and say, Joy to the World. You, you know, if it's really true, then show it. There's nothing wrong with emotions. I know in some Christian circles, and certainly in the Mennonite tradition, being emotional is, is not something that, that's a good thing. But I want to say to you, it is a good thing. God created our emotions. Why is it okay to be empathetic for something that's really sad, but it's not okay to be really happy for something that's really great? I, I don't understand that dichotomy. See, I think God wants us to be joyful. What's going to attract your neighbors who don't know Jesus or your loved ones who don't know Jesus or somebody you meet casually that doesn't know Jesus? What's going to attract that person to want to know Jesus? Well, seems pretty obvious to me. It's a sense of joy and happiness. And as we express joy and happiness, it tends to overflow. It's one of those things you can't contain. You, you, just, you just bubble over with it. And, and even though you don't mean to affect those around you, you do. And this is the attitude in life that God wants you and me to show. I know some of you all are very introverted and very quiet, and I'm not saying that's bad. I'm just saying show some joy and love in your interactions a little more often. <laughs> Jesus did. I think at that, at that wedding where he turns the water into wine, I think he was having a ball. No, I don't think he had too much to drink. That's a whole different ball game. I think he was just full of excitement to be there. And our lives ought to reflect that too. And if yours doesn't, well, try doing that. What have you really got to lose? Paul says here that love, self-sacrificing love, and joy are parts of what we get when we choose to put our hands in the hands of the Master. If you don't have love and joy in your life, then take a look at whose hand is sitting in yours, or whose hand yours is sitting in. I think... God wants us to be excited about life and about him. And I hope you are really, really excited. Well, think about it. I'll be back tomorrow with some other ideas. If you have a need or a concern, let us know. We'll do whatever we can as fast as we can to help meet those needs. So until tomorrow, God bless you. Have a wonderful, fantastic day. And I'll talk to you again.